has a, a very interesting story behind it uh, on this topic uh, that we're looking at today, the Bhagavad Gita and depression. Horatio Spafford in the 19th century wrote this song. He lost his um, two-year-old son um, to illness, and, um, and then the Great Chicago Fire burned down his uh, lawyer office, and he basically lost his business. And he sent his wife and four daughters on a trip to Europe. He, they were to go ahead. He would come later. And the ship sank, and he lost oh, four daughters. Oh, and his wife alone survived. So after this sort of Jobian litany of tragedies, he sat down in a state of just, well, you can imagine, and wrote this song, which is a pretty amazing testimony to where he was rooted um, in, in this faith in the Christ in the midst of all this loss. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty intense song. Mm -hmm. um, so with that background, we can go ahead and go to the slides now if you would. Um, what I've discovered over the last 20 some years it, with the New Thought Movement, uni unity, religious science, etc., is that we don't do depression well. We don't do negative emotions well. Um, about longer, than I want to think back, 20 years ago, when I first started teaching with the um, Holmes Institute, the Ministerial School for Religious Science, um, they asked me to do a class on introduction to philosophy and to include emotions in the discussion of philosophy. So I was pretty new to the New Thought Movement, and I remember asking this, this class full of students, about 12 ministerial students, um, how many of them had experienced depression? And I'll never forget that the, the heads all went down. I thought we were going to pray for a minute. <laughs> but they just didn't want to make eye contact. And I was a little bit shocked. I said, so nobody here has experienced depression. And finally, after a very uncomfortable few seconds of silence, and I thought, I'm just going to let this silence hang here. It's a good thing to do at times. One woman slipped her hand up like a puppet from behind the desk <laughs> and you can see it sort of slowly raising but her head was still down she raised her hand and some others looked over at her and then another one went up and then another one went up and finally one of the, the women in the class looked up and said I'm on Prozac right now <laughs> oh, and then somebody else said I'm on Zoloft and then the conversation started and we talked about depression one of the things, and I've shared this with you the times I've been here before, that our spirituality has to do is to be big enough to encompass it all. Right? We say it's all God, but I think some of us have little footnotes. Except for this. And this. This is not God. This is ego. This is ego. This is ego. So what does that do in the relationship, or with the relationship between God and ego when you say that? It's all God, but not this. It's ego. Point for ego. Well, it's a point for ego, but what does it say? About, it's all God. No. It's not all God. So let's say that from now on. It's all God except my ego. Unless, of course, your ego is part of God as well. <gasps> okay. I'll entertain that possibility as a new thought. Um, so I'm kind of predicating what I'm sharing this morning on that idea that if it's all God, then each of us is a tiny spark of God. And the great I am, each of us is a little... Say it again. The great I am, each of us is a little I am. I am. Yeah. Each of us is a little ego from the infinite ego. And that I'm suggesting, and this is in all the different New Thought writers and many other writers, that we are here on this earth in order to evolve or to develop that little I am ego spark that each of us is into a divine godling, as C.S. Lewis calls it. So each of us is becoming a godling. But the godling has to develop from that little seed into its infinite um, expression as you, as each of us as an individual. Let's entertain that possibility. Now, this is essentially what Jesus said and says all through the New Testament, as well as many other spiritual teachers. In the Gospel of Mark, a little quoted passage, um, Jesus said, this is what the kingdom of God is like. So he's using an analogy here. He said, a farmer scatters seed on the ground. Got that image in mind? Mm -hmm. Um, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up, the seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. Right? You don't know how the seed grows. You put it in the ground, it grows. All by itself, what produces grain? Seeds. 
the seed. The soil. There's something magic in the soil itself that makes that tiny little seed pop open, disintegrate, rot essentially, and put its roots down, as we see in these beautiful trees up here, and then it grows. He said all by itself, the soil produces grain, and notice the progression, the process. First the stalk, then the head, then the full kernel in the head, as soon as the grain is ripe, what? Because you reap the harvest. But you see the different stages. It goes from that little tiny seed pod, I call it the original iPod, the ego pod, <laughs> that each of us is. Each of us is that little seed. We come into this world biologically almost indistinguishable from each other, right? You look at babies, you know, yours is the best, but they all look kind of the same. And they don't have much... They have, I think each one has its character, its, its nascent character, there's no question. But they, that character has to grow, it has to develop. Mm -hmm. So, if that's the way it is, and if this is the way God has created this world, then part of what has to happen to each of us, just as with the seed, is that we have to do what in order to grow? We have to die, we have to fall apart. How many times have you fallen apart in your life? How many of you are in a state of falling apart right now? If you're over 50, you are. I am. John chapter 12, and this is a very resurrection, Easter kind of thing. Jesus said, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Well, that's good news, right? We all want to be glorified. It is an absolute truth, I tell you, that unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and... Dies. dies. In other words, it must be depressed. depressed. Understand? It must be <coughs> pressed down into the soil in order for that seed to die, die fall apart, and grow. grow up. So there's a downward trajectory and an upward trajectory. And I think a lot of times in our New Thought churches, what we focus on primarily, if not exclusively, is the upward tra trajectory. Does that make sense? We're always trying to move up. But what I'm trying to want to remind us on this Easter Sunday is that not only are we moving up in resurrection, we are also going down in death. And we're experiencing both simultaneously. But according to this verse in John, the ultimate goal is what? To die. Well, that's not the ultimate goal. To resurrect. Well, what, in John, what's the ultimate goal? That first sentence. Glorified. Glory. Can I hear a hallelujah? Hallelujah. hallelujah? Glory. We're moving to glory. That's the train we're getting on. It's the train we're on. But the movement to glory is oftentimes filled with experiences of when it's not well with my soul. When I have lost someone or something, or I'm in a state of health uh, disrepair. Things aren't going well. Can we make room in our spiritual paradigm for those moments of deep into the soil that makes the seed grow as part of the God process? That's the question. Now, we're going to come back to the cross in a minute. I want to refer to Robert's amazing work here. I talked to him about it before the service and uh, asked him what it meant, and he said he wasn't sure until he reflected on it. And I'll share with you what he said. But in the process of getting back to the Christian resurrection idea, let's look at the, the Hindu Bhagavad Gita to see that the story of death precedes life, depression precedes expression. Let's look at this story. How many of you, by out of curiosity, have read the <coughs> Bhagavad Gita? Anybody? Okay. <clears throat> it's a little tiny slice from a great Indian epic. It might be likened to our Bible, this is a condensed version of the Hindu Mahabharata. If you live in India, you know this well. In fact, there's actually ten volumes. This is a condensed two-volume version. And in fact, in India, if you live in India, remember how they used to play the Wizard of Oz every year in America? And, and they still do, if you're, they they still do it. You can't wait, right, to get there. Well, in India, they do the Mahabharata. There's 90-some episodes of the Mahabharata soap opera um, in India. And in this great work, this great epic of India, one tiny little narrow slice of it is the Bhagavad Gita. So the Bhagavad Gita is in the midst of this great epic that talks about um, war and love and marriage and, and death and life and births and all, you know, politics and 
Everything is in this great set of books. And the Bhagavad Gita is slipped right in the middle of it. And in the Bhagavad Gita, we have one of the key characters in this Hindu soap opera, and his name is Arjuna. He's the general, who here looks like he has an excedrin headache um, <laughs> standing there. And in the story, you have to understand, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's preceded this. He's become a great hero. He is the rock star in India. He is Dwight D. Eisenhower, Petraeus, and he put them all together, he is that person. He's Hercules in Greek mythology. He is the most amazing warrior in India of his time. So he's in the midst of a great battle to basically save the culture and the country, a kind of Star Wars, right? Light versus dark thing. And he's in the middle of this battle. He goes out into the middle of the battlefield. Krishna is his charioteer, driving his chariot. That's Krishna down there with the blue divine face. The reason the face is blue is the color of the sky, which is divinity. But Arjuna doesn't really know that Krishna is who he is. But in the middle of the battlefield, he stops as he looks on the other side at the enemy, and he sees cousins, he sees brothers, it's a great civil war, he sees trainers who helped him in his gr growing up years, but they've become corrupted. But he says, he falls to the, it says in the Bhagavad Gita, he falls on his face in the chariot, stands up with his face in his, his, face in his hands, and he says to Krishna, I can't do it. I give up. This is too hard. He suffers what in this culture we might call a midlife crisis. <laughs> How many of you have had a midlife crisis? How many of you have had dozens of midlife crises? <laughs> I told somebody when I was 20, I said, I think I've already had four midlife crises. I think my teenage years, I had one pretty much every day. <laughs> so Arjun is in the middle of this great depression in the middle of his life. Carl Jung said that about the age of 35 to 45, most of us go through a super crisis. And he doesn't want to do what he's supposed to do, which is go on with his life. So Krishna begins to teach him. Krishna says something in about 10 chapters to begin with. Arjuna, you must realize it is all God moving you to a higher reality. That's the basic summary of the lesson. In other words, even when you are in the midst of one of these despairing midlife crises, and you're depressed, it is not well with your soul, you feel like giving up, you don't even know if you believe in God anymore. Have any of you ever been an atheist in the middle of... All right, thank you for one honest answer. Anybody want to put a pinky up a little atheist? <laughs> Most of us have those moments where we're not even sure if this stuff is true. What if this is all part of the God process? You understand? What if it's all part of the God process? Mm -hmm. Krishna suggests that it is. In fact, in the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna gives Arjuna, you can see him in his chariot before this manifestation of Krishna as God in chapter 11. But in the first 10 verses, Krishna instructs Arjuna to try to bring him out of or through this depression. I won't say out of, but through this depression. Because the purpose of depression in the Bhagavad Gita the purpose of depression in all the great literature of religious literature and mythology, the purpose of depression is to, to make the seed grow. grow. Which way? Uh, up. Down. 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 Oh. <laughs> You've got to root. Oh, that's sure. right. yeah. Root into the dark, deep soil of soul before you have what it takes to start to move that stalk up into the light and to blow that lo lotus blossom before the sun. The lotus blossom is the symbol in India. You see it everywhere. Guru's sitting on it, the god's sitting on it. The lotus is a symbol of a seed in a pond that drops into the muck at the bottom of the pond. And then it puts its roots down. This is very Hindu. And it puts the roots down in the dark. And oftentimes that, 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 those losses, those things that you're accounting on that go away. Anybody been betrayed? Ever been betrayed by someone? This is part of it. Just imagine if we started to look at these experiences that we go through that are not pleasant as part of the process of spiritual growth as much as the moving up. This is what's going on in the Bhagavad Gita. Um... When Krishna reveals himself to Arjuna, after Arjuna is ready for the full revelation of it's all God, you get that in that image up there? This is the idea that Krishna says, now you can see it's all God. 
This is from Bhagavad Gita chapter 10, where Krishna, as God, as Vishnu says, I am time. I am the Atman, or the soul, seated in the hearts of how many creatures? Oh. All creatures. I am the beginning, the middle, and the end of all beings. Of weapons, I am the thunderbolt. I am Kandarpa, the god of love. I am Yama, the lord of death. I am the wielder of weapons. I am Brahma, the creator, whose manifold faces turn everywhere. I am the spiritual science of the Atman, and I am the ultimate truth. Now this is what Arjuna needs in the midst of his despair and depression, is to come to the realization. And what's the word realization mean? What's the core piece of that word? Real. real. When things real, eyes. It's one thing to have a theory of reality. It's another to have a grasp of reality. It's real that this process of going through the darkness into the depths of the soil and putting the roots down is just as much of the realization as moving up into the light. This is what's being said in the Bhagavad Gita. We see it in the three great gods of India, the triumvirate that it's called. You've got Brahma on the left there, the four faces of God looking to the four corners of the universe, the great creator God. Each of us is created, yes? Yes. Mm -hmm. And in the other second great God in the Hindu trinity, there is Vishnu, the preserver. This is the God who comes and gives light and life and restoration and helps people through their trials and brings them into great prosperity. This is a wonderful God. Yes? Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. But there is also Shiva, the destroyer. Shiva is the god in India, or the Indians recognize that part of life is, we're not just created, we're not just preserved and succeeding, we are also dying. And Shiva is very clearly the god who comes in order to bring new life through death, through death or through the, mm, the old life moving away. We call this depression. We call it fear. We call it panic. We have many different names for it. But in India, there's a place for those experiences as well as us being created and preserving, uh, being preserved and succeeding. So there's room for it. In India, they have, how many of you have seen this Naharaja image of Shiva? How many of you, just out of curiosity, anybody seen this before? This is one of the preeminent images in India. And what you have here is Shiva, the destroyer, dancing. And he has his foot on a little dwarf down there at the bottom, in between two, can you see those on each side? Those monsters. Do you ever feel like that? Mm -hmm. Like you're dwarfed, you're being stomped down into the, depressed into the soil, and you're surrounded by dragons, and you're saying, I'm feeling terrified and really depressed. In India, there is room for this, because this is part of the dance of Shiva. Shiva the destroyer is doing away with the old self, that self that's done. You understand? It's done. Each of us goes through experiences in our life that bring us happiness and joy and fulfillment, but there's a time when each of those experiences, they're done. They're over. They pass in order to make room for the next thing. So Shiva in this circle is dancing. What do you see on the edges of this circle? What do you think those little... That's fire. It's a clock, essentially, where every second is burned away. Each tick of the clock burns away what was, what was, what was, and it moves into what is, what is, what is. So the idea here is to let go in this circle of life of what was. And this is the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, Krishna tells Arjuna, if you attach to anything, anything, you're going to be in, you're going to eventually be in a state of despair despair and depression because in this world all things pass away in order that the new may come glory can you say it with me glory. glory so glory is the goal the new thought movement is right in its emphasis on glory but the danger is that sometimes we only talk about glory so we don't realize that when the unglorious is happening it's also part of the God process so here Shiva is dancing, he's got one foot on the ground stomping the ego into depression so it will go away. But where's the other foot? It's on the way. I mean, you ever remember Jackie Gleason, the old Jackie Gleason shows where he's going? Yeah. Yeah. Right? This is what's going on here. Shiva is saying, it's not just that I'm pushing the old into the ground, we're moving. We're moving into glory, 
We're going to the next thing, but this has got to stay behind. This is done. But I like it. I'm not done with it. Well, yes, you are. You're done with it because something more amazing is coming. But I've been diagnosed with cancer. Well, if it's all God, then you're moving even through that experience into some, something glorious. Now, I'm not telling people that they have to believe this, but this is the basic idea in Hinduism and Christianity and all the great religions. We're moving forward into glory through these things. And Krishna, or God, or Christ is teaching trust. Period. Trust. Yeah, but! You ever do that? I trust. Yeah, but! I want more information about this. Can't give you any more. There's no more to give. Trust. I am crushing the oppressor in order to make you anew. But it's, it doesn't feel like the oppressor. Well, it doesn't feel like the oppressor, but it is. This old thing is going away, so something new may come. And here's an image from Christian. Let me go back. Now watch the screen. From Christian iconography, Satan is the thing being crushed. Satan is that part of our lives that needs to go away. You find it also in this image of the cross where the serpent is being crushed. This is from the book of Genesis. Same imagery. You understand? The foot on the old you have it in Kali. We don't have time to talk about this, this idea this morning. But in the Bhagavad Gita and Hinduism in general, Kali is this goddess who is standing on whom? Do you recognize who's under her foot? Shiva. Shiva. Even death must be destroyed. Thank God. Because we're moving to glory. So the, one, the beautiful thing here is that that Kali is essentially this goddess who is the goddess of babies and children and infancy. And she is saying, I'm moving you into infancy, and even the great god Shiva, the god of death, has to die, that you might be reborn. reborn. And in the Christian message, the idea of the crucifixion and resurrection is carried in this Shiva image, that on the cross, this, this bloody, horrific image is depression and it is part of the spiritual process what do you see to the right of the cross in this image you see the resurrected Christ because we're moving to glory can you say it with me like you like you believe it we're moving to glory and in the meantime we're moving through difficult experiences yes yes is that possible yes I talked to Robert before the service started and I asked him, he's back here, can I share this? Thank you. I asked him what this, what was going through his mind as he created this cross with this wire on it, and he said, I, I don't really know. He says, let me interpret it. So we walked up here and he said, I see this chicken wire as things being interconnected. All things being interconnected. Isn't that beautiful? And there's this inglorious kind of crucifix with nails driven into this connectedness. Isn't that beautiful? You ever feel like this? <laughs> like somehow I'm trusting, I'm relying that it's all connected, but I feel like I'm nailed to a cross. And yet it's all connected. This is brilliant. You were inspired. He won't even smile. <laughs> smiling, trust me. On the is, yes, good. It is. <laughs> this is brilliant because this is the essential Easter message. Where's the Christ? Not on the cross. Christ has moved to glory. Christ has moved to glory. But to get to glory, there was all this jumble of this life where at times most of us find ourselves at times going, I don't see how it's connected. Okay. Horatio Spafford did, could not see how the loss of his two-year-old son was connected to glory. How the burning down of his business and the loss of his income was connected to glory. How losing few, four precious daughters, imagine that was somehow connected to glory. When he pinned that hymn, it is well with my soul. soul. Not in the physical level was it well, 
But he was trusting that somehow in this jumble, this intertwined at times, it seems like messy life, that there is this glorious connection where the infinite, it is all I am, is bringing each of us little I am's together in what the Hindus call Dharma. We get our word adhere from the Hindu word Dharma. You can see the D-H-R in adhere, Dharma. So that in Christ, in the resurrection message, every bit of your life, every bit of my life, Emotions, high emotions, low emotions, experiences, it all Connected. adheres through faith. Through faith. Does that make sense? Yes. yes. Sir, it does. Mm -hmm. So, let's just take a moment and pray together if you'd like to join <coughs> me. I invite you to take a deep breath. <sighs> Infinite Christ field. Loving Christ presence. Fill this room and fill the hearts of every single one of us in this room with your presence. So that it is well with our souls, no matter what. And I'm the first to confess that at times I go out of that field. And I look around at things and I look in the mirror and go, holy crap, who is that? <laughs> Give us graciously give us faith to trust. Give us that joy that we sang about so beautifully today with Mercedes', Mercedes song that there's joy, joy, joy down in my heart. Let that joy be in the middle. Let joy be the fire that burns in the middle of anything that's going on around us as we see that we are connected to the infinite through this seed process of development. And so it is. Blessings on you on this glorious Easter, and um, that's all. Amen.